what they think the puzzle is. Gary Wayne, and I've written a book called The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind. It's a, it's a book that I spent 30 years in research and in writing the book. It was one of those books that um, I thought I wanted to write. I wanted to discuss and connect how this very, very strange verse and chapter in Genesis, Genesis 6, connects to so much else of the Bible and what has taken place in history. And what caught my attention was this very odd few lines in the opening to actually what is the flood narrative. And so how did that connect to the flood narrative? And that's where the sons of God went to the daughters of men and they produced Nephilim. And in some translations, like the King James Version, it actually says giants instead of Nephilim. And it also said that these Nephilim were before and after the flood. And so how did that happen if every, all, everyone was destroyed except for Noah and his family on the flood? And then all these giants pop up after the flood, names like Avites and Amites and Samson, and fallen angels and demons being very much involved as a major sign for the end times. And also the interesting connection, what is in, in the Luke's version of that prophecy, what is their connection to Sodom? So I wanted to create a narrative that made some sense in my mind uh, and ex try and come up with a rational explanation that makes sense biblically. I decided I wanted to bring in a connection that I thought might be obvious that there were giants recorded in every other culture around the world on every continent and was that just a coincidence or was it telling the same kind of story and as I was doing that research I came across documents and books and information about a society that everybody is familiar with called Freemasonry that actually takes their prehistory legends all the way back to the same time frame as Genesis 6 and before with another parallel account, albeit from a different belief system and a different perspective. And all of a sudden that brought the secret societies into this whole narrative that starts in prehistory, also crosses the flood. And so I wanted to connect that. So the book at some point in time went from a narrative just about Nephilim to a book about the creation and the rise of the Nephilim and their kingships alongside the mystical religions and the secret societies that rose uh, up around them, partnered with them, somehow crossed the flood and continue to this day. We have the sons of God going to the daughters of men creating the Nephilim uh, which became the uh, heroes of old and men of renown. And so when we look at some original translations there, we look at the sons of God and who were they, um, the Nephilim, who exactly were they, and then the heroes of old and the men of renown, which is the hero, uh, is the Hebrew word Gibran. And so then we have in how people will interpret this verse, who actually are these people? And so that's the contentious issues that um, you're referring to and is argued from all different aspects. So just let me slowly walk through uh, who these three groups or three names of groups actually were and why it is exactly as it is written in Genesis 6. And so the sons of God, many people believe that they were just the sons of Seth and therefore these weren't actually giants. They were just um, another branch of people that came up that were evil. Well, that's, that's a very good interpretation because if you go into the New Testament 
and we talk about the sons of God, those are just human beings. Or if we talk about the children of, of, of Israel, those were just average human Israelites. So what makes the sons of God in Genesis 6 actually fallen angels? Well, the original translation is the Ben Aha Elohim, and that stands for the sons of God. And if we want to go for an exact Old Testament interpretation we need to go to job job the book of job and in three particular verses in job it translates angels with an asterisk and an annotation at the bottom of the page that in ancient hebrew angels were the sons of god and so if we now if we look at the two other possible translations the children of israel in the old testament and the sons of god in the new testament we find that those two translations, the first one is the children of Israel. That is actually a prophecy for the end time and beyond. So that's not referring to the same sons of God that are in Genesis 6. And in the New Testament, it's a doctrine of adoption into being a sons of God. So it comes at the Pentecost and it has no direct relationship to what's being referred to in the Old Testament, in particular Genesis 6. So I'm on pretty sound ground, I think that, although I understand the argument that people think that they were regular men, if they were just regular men marrying the daughters of regular men, they wouldn't produce giants. I mean, something would be have to be going on that is completely different, and uh, you would have to actually add to the narrative to make some sort of sense of it. And so now we move into the word Nephilim, which actually translates as the fallen ones. And so some people say that those were the, uh, the angels and not, um, and, and that the giants were actually the Gibberim, and I'll get to Gibberim next, which are the, the men of renown. Well, if we look at mythologies from around the world, and people have probably heard people like out of uh, the mythologies, like in Greek, where we have the Titans, or we have the Anunnaki in Sumerian mythology. The Titans were two different groups. One was giants and one's, one were the, the gods. And so if we look at the Anunnaki in Sumerian mythology, we have the same thing. So you have two groups. One was giants and one was gods. And so the second group, which is the offspring of the gods and human females in polytheist and uh, philosophy and, and mythology, uh, they produced earthborn gods. And we need to understand that the Nephilim were like a demigod. And they were a demigod in both the Genesis account and on all other accounts around the world. So they were part god or part fallen angel in the monotheist belief system, our belief system. And they were also part god and part uh, human in all the other belief systems. So we have something that's rather unique and it's, it's a very consistent narrative around the world. And so again, humans copulating with other humans can't produce demigods. And so when people want to confuse Nephilim, even though it's a specific separate word with the sons of God, which is one of the other arguments, they're confusing the two, even though you can have the same name, we know from translations that the sons of God were always the Bena Ha Elohim. They were not called Nephilim in the monotheist belief system. Now, many people say that the Nephilim weren't giants and supergiants. They were just Gibberim, men of renown and heroes of old. The Gibberim weren't necessarily Nephilim. They were, but they were kings and they were potentates and they were evil potentates. And so when Gibberim is used later in the Old Testament. We see it come up in Ezekiel when it's talking about very powerful kings, and we also see it come up when it's talking about Nimrod. And I do understand many people think that Nimrod was a giant, but I'll argue it was actually Gibberim, and that was the specific application for Nimrod as a hero of old. And so people's argument will be is, is yes, they were powerful kings, but, but they weren't giants. What people need to understand is the Bible is very specific in the application of, of the words and it's always 100% accurate and it is never in contradiction. So Nephilim were both giants and kings and evil potentates. So you could be a Gibram and be human 
and be an evil potentate, but that doesn't necessarily make you Nephilim. But the Nephilim were both. And in the old world and immediately after the flood, the Nephilim were, they usurped all of the kingships. And they controlled all the royal dynasties and they ruled over humankind. So that so we have those three entities. We have the sons of God, we have the Gibberim, and we have the Nephilim. Now if we go over to Greek mythology, people will understand if we talk about Hercules or Theseus or any of the famous Titans, they might be surprised to know that when we go into the ancient annals recording these mythologies, they were also known as the men of renown and heroes of old. And again, these were giants and they were demigods and they were the sons of gods. And so I think the word, when we have a coincidence such as this that crosses over to other religions and other mythologies, and there's more of these testimonies around the world, that we need to take probably into account that when there are parallel accounts, they're telling a similar story, perhaps from a different perspective, but understand that they're telling the same story. And so when we look at these giants being the kings, we have to start looking at their dynasties and the bloodlines that descended from them that exist to this day. And also in Genesis 6, we look at the controversial statement that Nephilim were, bo were both before and after the flood. So we have to then to take into account, did angels go and copulate a second time after the flood to create giants, or did giants somehow survive the flood? And I'll take that on in the book and provide both ex explanations as possible. And I think people will be very, very surprised at the amount of evidence to support both. Now, the daughters of men would be the other component of Genesis 6. And most people assume that that's just going to be the descendants of Cain. And I bring this up and I'll prove in the book that likely they were the descendants of Cain and that they were predisposed to create this sin that it was the daughters of Cain that mated with the sons of angels in the sixth generation, the generation of Jared to produce the giants. And what's important about this is, is to understand Genesis 6, we need to understand what happened immediately after and immediately before. So Genesis 6 is actually the introduction to the flood narrative. So by implication, and there is no separation from the discussion and the introduction of these giants that goes immediately into the flood narrative. So by implication, the story is likely connected. And I'll connect that in the book and, and have people understand that. But we also need to understand that there were six generations before the giants were created. And that's when we need to understand and learn about why the Bible records the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth. And so Seth would be the, the lineage that Noah came from, and then Cain uh, had another whole line of, of descendants that in prehistory also were recorded as kings. So we have this kingship concept, which is not a natural concept for uh, our religion or old Jewish religion, because kingship didn't happen in our religion until the time of King Saul, which was thousands of years later. So the king concept is a polytheist concept that actually started in Genesis with the Nephilim and with Cain before that. But when we start digging into the Cain sort of background and what was going on in prehistory, we start to learn about the rise of the mystical religions that the Nephilim imposed over the whole people of the earth. And so then we need to learn about how this mysticism arised. And that starts with the seven sacred sciences and the illicit knowledge that came from the fallen angels to the descendants of Cain. And so that's one of the big reasons why they were so predisposed to create this violation against the laws of creation where the seed or the spirit of heaven was going to be married with the flesh of the earth and create uh, gods of the earth. So one of the primary sort of doctrines of the early part of my book is, is I'm going to make a case that that is a violation against the laws of creation. Now these sciences and this additional information that came from 
the fallen angels developed into all of the major arts and sciences that uh, we, we know of today. But it's how far they were able to develop these sciences and how they were able to pervert that and to secret that knowledge, they created a mystical religion. And it was a sun worship religion and Enoch, son of Cain, uh, not Enoch, uh, a son of, or descendant of Seth. Uh, we need to understand there's two Enochs in prehistory. And so Enoch, son of Cain, developed this whole knowledge base into a knowledge-based religion that people might know today as Gnosis or Gnosticism. And, and again, this is all connected. And so they secreted all of this advanced knowledge into these mystical religions, into an initiatory religion, which is where Freemasonry started. And actually Freemasonry comes from masonry, which is the fifth science of geometry. And so when we look at the craft legends from Freemasonry, we understand they say and they recognize whether it's Tubal Cain or Cain or Enoch or any of the descendants of Cain as their patriarchs and their founders of this secret, uh, these secret societies to house this information. And they took this information to such a level that they claim that, and I want to understand, they claim that they created the great monuments of the world that mystifies people today, monuments like Stonehenge or monuments like the pyramids. This is their recollection, and this is the same types of secret societies that we see today. So we see this partnership that happened in the antediluvian world, and for people who don't know that word, that's just a, a large word or technical word for before the flood. And so we have this rise of, in the sixth generation, of the giants which usurp the kingships. They partner then with the mystical religions from the Cain line and the secret societies uh, to govern uh, the people, the kingships, and to build the monuments. So we have these, this, this major partnership that now becomes an answer for why is that so important in Genesis 6 leading to the flood because violence was everywhere, evil was everywhere, and uh, not respecting the true God of the universe and not worshiping the God was absolutely omnipresent because they implemented this belief system universally and with force. And so by the time of Noah, only Noah and his family were not perverted by this this tyranny that was going on by the Nephilim kingships and the religion that they that they had spun off. And thus came the flood. Okay, so let's now talk a little bit more about um, the religion, the sun worship, Sabaism, as some people might know of it, and, and relate that to the flood story in the religion of uh, the Nephilim and, and the people before the flood. And I think people are going to recognize that this is very, very familiar to with what actually crossed the flood as well, because again, it was the same religion. And so when we talk about the mystical religions, it is a sun worship. And in, I think in all the different mythologies that people know around the world and all the different religions around the world, it's basically a sun worship religion. And it's a pantheon of gods. And those are the two connections. And so how this connects together is, is that the fallen angels and perhaps even fallen angels mating with fallen angels to create a lower set of gods in the pantheon with the Nephilim as the earthborn gods and the kingships uh, at the lower level of this pantheon is the polytheist religions and it's the same pantheon that is all around the world. It doesn't matter whether or not it's in Greece or it's in Central America or if it's India. It is the same religion and it is the same pantheon. And so the fallen angels make up the pantheon along with whatever they created thereafter. And so these are the same dark angels that mated with the sons or the daughters of men to create these giants. And so there's 200 of them that actually went to Mount Hermon then started the first generation of immortal giants. And so the demons that people refer to and were also part of what they would call hero worship, which comes out of Greek mythology, these were the bodiless spirits of the giants. So the first generation of giants was created immortal because they had the immortal spirit of the angels. But 
their bodies weren't immortal. So those bodies either died out or they committed suicide to prevent the pain of the aging body. But those spirits were not permitted into heaven. And so that's the demons that Jesus talks about in the New Testament. And the crime for creating these giants were that those dark angels who I would call impassioned, um, they were locked away in the abyss. And these are the same angels in the abyss that will be released in the end time. So as a violation against the laws of creation, that was the punishment. Okay, so now we have the, the religion of Enoch, which is a, a sun-worshipping religion based in mysticism and the secret sciences and initiations and sacrifices um, and all sorts of uh, what we would look at as abominations, whether it's orgies or sexual perversion and on and on and on, was all created before the flood. And so people knew that there was a apocalypse coming and so they were forewarned by the angels, the fallen angels. And so they needed to find a way to protect this information and get it across the flood. And that's what the sons of Lamech, and just so that people understand, there's a Lamech on the Seth line and there's a Lamech on the Cain line. And that's where a lot of this sort of meshing together of the, of the bloodlines and confusing of scripture and information as to who was who in, in prehistory. Those sons and daughters, and Nama was the daughter involved, they reinvigorated this religion and mysticism and in their generation, which was the generation after the creation of the giants, and they found a way to record the information uh, in terms of what those sciences and religions were, and where Enoch had created nine vaults with like 36,525 books that were uh, hidden away and so that was how this information crossed the flood and how the religion crossed the flood. The key thing to remember is is this is the same polytheist religion that we have all around the world and I think it will resonate with people just as when we look at what will resonate in those cultures is all of this sort of dragon and snake imagery. And that's because the fallen angels were seraphim angels and they had the face of a viper. And so you put wings on a translucent spirit being and you have a form of a dragon, which is also the first form in the fairy mythology because there are four fairies. And in, in their mythology, there are the, uh, the opalescent fairies that came from other planets who produced the earthborn fairies, which is the Nephilim. And then there was the demons, or the demons as they would call them, and those are the spirits uh, of the first generation of Nephilim that died out. And then you have the elemental, which is the fourth one, and there's three classes of little people where now we, we could talk down the road about a connection to the alien mythology because that's directly related. And so this information crossed the flood, and it turns out that person that we just talked about before, Nimrod, partners with a fellow called Hermes at Babel. And they find this information and they resurrect it. And you get a hint of how powerful this information is at Babel when it says in that story about the Tower of Babel that now working together and speaking as one language, there is nothing that is impossible for them. And what they are building is they're building a ziggurat and a, a fortress very similar to what was going on in the antediluvian world. They were recreating the same rebellion that caused the flood after the flood. But the question gets to be is, is how did the giants survive the flood or were they recreated after the flood? Because you could interpret Genesis 6 either way. So if we look at a second impassioned violation, and we already know that the, the original Nephilim or the original fallen angels were put into the abyss for, as punishment for creating the giants, then that means if there's another violation, then the next one is absolutely out of spite to recreate these, these giants, and it's certainly one possibility. 
there's nothing really in the Bible that says that there was a second impassioned violation. But if we go into uh, other mythologies and other religions, we do get that. So let me cover off a couple of that and I'll cover off the other possibilities of Nephilim surviving the flood. So when we go into um, mythology as an example that people would know uh, two for sure, I think I, Greek mythology and um, Sumerian mythology. And in the Greek, not in the Greek, let's go to the Sumerian one first. The Epic of Gilgamesh is something that everybody's taught in school, and it's used as a representative argument that the Bible copied down the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh is the original text for the flood story. So they're a very similar story on the macro level, but totally different on the detail aspect of it. So when we look at Gilgamesh, here is a figure that is recorded in the book of Enoch as being before the flood and was actually aware of the flood that was coming, uh, even though he knew there was nothing that they could do to prevent it. And in the epic of Gilgamesh, he is known as an Anunnaki, what we would call Nephilim from a Christian perspective that survived the flood. And he was a demigod as described in the epic of Gilgamesh. So he was he was part divine, part human, and he was a giant and a evil giant. And the person he tells the story to is a fellow called Anakedon. Now Anakedon is created after the flood. And in the same manner as Gilgamesh was before the flood, and in the same manner as all giants were created around the world. And he was created as a counterbalance to prevent the evil that Gilgamesh was capable of doing and did both before and after the flood. But he becomes friends with Gilgamesh as opposed to counterbalancing and they actually partner more into evil. So this is the second character in the preamble that's introduced in the Epic of Gilgamesh and he too is a demigod created by the gods and a human female. And so they're telling a story about the flood story about depending on which language you want to uh, uh, translate it from, the two names that are most common are Apnepishtin and Zayazudra. As the king of Mesopotamia or Sumeria before the flood. And he takes, uh, he's, he's warned by the gods that there is a flood coming and to take uh, a similar type of uh, an account as in Noah to take animals on, on this ark and to take many people of his family and much of his kin. So we now assume that Gilgamesh was probably akin to Zayazudra. And so he's the archetypical Anunnaki Nephilim potentate. So he's not this sort of peaceful agrarian. He's this military warrior, evil potentate that we had talked about. And so is this family that he takes along with him. So just in the preamble to their flood story, we're talking about giants and their account of surviving the flood. And also in there, we with Anakedon of that creation, that also echoes a possible second violation to the laws of creation. If you look at Greek mythology, it's basically Pyrrha or Nora uh, as, the, as the wife of uh, Deucalion, because in, in Norea we'll have several names, especially in the Gnostic religion and other mythologies, but they believe that Deucalion and Pyrrha or Nora, Norea was the same as Noah. And that's the Greek translation. Well, that's not actually true. And so what we find is, is that Deucalion is the son of Prometheus. And again, in the Greek mythology, Prometheus was both a god and a titan. And so we have uh, an interesting relationship there again. So we understand this, that um, Deucalion was either the son of a titan Nephilim or was a Nephilim son of Prometheus the god, but either way, He's an Ephilim. And uh, in the Gnostic religion, they believe Norea is just a derivative of Nama, which was one of the descendants of Cain and daughter of Lamech that we had just talked about. So now we have uh, a combining of the story of another Nephilim survival. And when we look at all the accounts of prehistory, most of the accounts of prehistory and other religions and other mythologies are actually the survival of giants 
on an ark or they went to a mountain and there are some other stories about humans but the most of the ones that survive are the are the survival accounts of giants and if we also look to the Gnostic religion uh, which has a Christian sort of gloss to it but it is distinctly polytheist and it is distinctly the old religion they also have an account of a particular character in prehistory called Seth but this would be Enamaka Seth and this would be a, uh, another race of giants that was created in a cloud so sort of a DNA manipulation as another account that would be similar to what might be happening in the alien mythology so we do have an account of, of DNA manipulation and creating a superhuman Nephilim um, in prehistory from the Gnostic religions just as we can look at other DNA manipulation with centaurs and other beings that just aren't around anymore and cross and particularly the crossbreeding of species and things like that and also in the Gnostic religion they have a very very specific accounts and several accounts of Sodom and Gomorrah and that these were not cities of evil because in the polytheist belief system these were cities of light cities of knowledge and they believe that in these writings at least it says in these writings that there was another planting of this race the giant race in Sodom and in Gomorrah after the flood so we take from that that they record uh, another violation against the laws of creation so we have several we have a couple different ways we have both ways that are possible and perhaps both did happen and if we look at the biblical account to say is that possible at Sodom and Gomorrah that that's where the second violation occurred it is very possible because in Genesis 14 we talk about a war of four kings against five and there's a Mesopotamian alliance that invades the Middle East and all these nations that are listed are giant nations whether it's the Amorites or the Amalekites or the Avites or the Amites and on and on and on and on and there's several battles that take place and this is at the time of Abraham and Lot that's the invading army from Mesopotamia that Lot is taken captive of um, that we're talking about and then shortly thereafter Sodom is destroyed so there's a definite connection that Nephilim were there they were the kings of, of, of the civilizations after the flood and after Babel and likely a large reason for uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and why it had descended so far down into abominations and, and evil. And so if we look again scripturally how were giants able to survive the flood? And when we take into account that the flood story says that Basically, all human beings were wiped out. All land creatures were wiped out. So how can this be? So it's either somehow they survived the flood or there was a second um, violation against the flood. Now I'm going to bring in something that people kind of overlook. It does say in the flood story that the flood was designed to wipe out all the life forms that were created by God. And so you have a possible skirting or very specific wording that that did not include beings created by fallen angels. And so when you understand that fallen angels were created through the daughters of men, perhaps not all of them were wiped out and perhaps the stories of prehistory are true with all of these different uh, cultures around the world recording that these giants actually survived the flood either going to a mountain or into a cloud or on an ark. Okay, now let's also look at the, what I think people overlook very often is, is the table of nations in First Chronicles and in Genesis. And in, the tables of nations does is it records Noah and his three sons and all of their descendants. Well, all of a sudden we have very early in Genesis all of these nations like the Raphaites and the Anakites uh, that do not descend out of the table of nations so again they either survived the flood or there was another recreation and it can be either I, I actually you know at 
sometimes I say it's one and sometimes I say it's the other. Actually, you know, the more I think about it and the more time goes, I think it's probably both. And there are so many nations that, that survived the, the flood, or at least somehow seemingly survived the flood because their names got to come out of nowhere. So when we look at uh, Seir in the table of nations, Seir's name enters as a people who the descendants of Esau, um, son of, of Isaac, uh, married into and these people come out of nowhere and these are the Amalekites and the Horites and there again is nothing recorded there in the table of nations or in the Old Testament to say how these people's how these people came about and so when we look further into the Old Testament and we talk about the Amalekites this is the beginning of another intermarriage and a hybrid population of giants being created that was totally anti uh, descendants of Isaac and Jacob. And so uh, we can also look at accounts of other peoples that aren't giants that somehow survived the flood somehow, some way, because again, their names kind of come out of nowhere and they are not part of the table of nations. And few of those ones, just to name an example, would be the Kenites and the Kenizzites. And of course, their history would say that they actually descended from Tubal Cain. And so when we talk about the Kenizzites and the, the Kenites uh, saying that they go back to uh, send back to Tubal Cain, that's why we see this sort of mythos, uh, this mythology that continues through religions and entertainment uh, of people surviving the flood and, go, and descending back to Tubal Cain. And probably the clearest one I, and most recent one was the recent movie about the flood and Noah, and where they insert Tubal Cain being on the flood uh, on the ark and surviving the flood and the Gnos that's 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 a 100 percent gnostic belief where they believe that um two of the sons for sure and in some accounts they'll say noah was was nephilim as well but uh they believe that uh, tubal cain and ham were the descendants of of tubal cain and they were not the sons of Noah. And so again, you have to understand this is a different religion, a different belief system, but this belief system is everywhere and impacts all of our society. So we see those belief systems inserted in very strange and odd spots all the time. And when we talk about an ongoing mythos, I mean, I think so many people are probably familiar with the series on the History Channel with ancient aliens. and. I watch Ancient Aliens all the time. I don't think there's a show that, that I've missed because I like the information that they bring in. I understand their perspective. Uh, I don't agree with their perspective, but what they're talking about is, is that the gods uh, of ancient prehistory were actually um, aliens and not gods. And so there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of how they're trying to explain it except that from a biblical perspective, these aliens were the fallen angels, very advanced beings, and they're saying they just weren't quite as advanced, they're just more advanced than, than people of prehistory. So the accounts that they bring in are, are extraordinarily um, relevant and pertinent, but for a Christian, just understand it from their perspective and then relate to it as to what Scripture says. And then when we talk about this mythos, we're talking about what everybody looks at as the little little gray aliens. I think everybody recognizes that most aliens are um, these little grays. Well, when we talked about the four classes of fairies, in the in there are three subsets, and in the one subset it's called the sec the the subset of gnomes uh, and goblins and sprites, and these were ugly little fairies. They weren't the pretty little ones with wings and everything that you see like in Disney and in Shakespeare and things like that. But these little ones, these, they had a section called the, the, the Little Greys, the Grey Neighbors as they were known in Scotland. And so these little goblins were identical to the descriptions of the Little Greys uh, that we know of today and in the sightings. And what's important about that is, is that these greys had flying machines and they're offering technology and the ability to evolve and they would kidnap people and return them. They would do DNA experimentation on them. They were looking to create hybrids. 
and in in my book, I'll give an abduct uh, an abduction by a fairy by a gray neighbor um, that you will find absolutely amazing. And if you didn't know it was an abduction by a fairy, a little people, you would think it was an al an alien abduction. So again, we see little people in these these four classes of fairies. We see this all throughout history and all throughout our entertainment and all throughout mythology. And so if you go to the Ring of the Lords in Tolkien, you see these little people, a number of them, not all of them, because there was many kinds of little people. And what they're trying to tell us or what they believe is, is that many of these little people and other beings survived. And if you look at the end of Tolkien and it's sort of in Lord of the Rings, you have all of these beings going away on a boat. It's kind of has an imagery of an ark. So we, we take that probably at the time of the flood and the ark that these beings went away and that they survive today. Because what Tolkien says is this is now the age of, of humankind. And also in fairy mythology, just as in alien mythology, Many people believe that these spaceships come through portals. And in the fairy mythology, whether it's, it's a she, uh, spelled S-I-D-H-E, or a fairy mound, or as in King Arthur, the ladies of the lake, they guarded these portals to the other world. And so you see this incredible parallel of imagery and mythology with the alien mythology in just so many ways uh, to what we're talking about um, with fairies and with aliens. And of course the fairy mythology goes back to the bloodlines and the descendants of, of giants. And the Tuatha Dé Nan, which uh, are sort of the home race of the fairy race, uh, were, were Nephilim and they were the offspring of the fairies in Ireland in the Celtic mythology. When we look at the bloodlines that survive on these kingships of Nephilim, there is a dragon bloodline, which is the male bloodline, and there is a fairy bloodline, which is the matriarchy. And both of those in both imagery and in importance in tracking the genealogy of the giants uh, is very, very important. And so that's why we see the fairy mythos and the dragon mythos, whether it's Dracula or uh, snake imagery. These are all the imagery of the kingships and the bloodlines. And when we understand that, we start to understand why all of this is kept alive in so many aspects, whether it's literature, whether it is entertainment, whether it's science fiction, and it has been that way throughout our 6,000 years because it's the imagery and the allegories of the mystical religion and the kingships and the bloodlines that have descended down through the generations. Okay, so now let's, let's start bringing this together a little bit more. And so what's what's the purpose of, of the other side or the descendants of giants and, and how and why do they want to enslave humankind? So let's again go first back to prehistory. So whether or not you're talking about the Greek uh, Titan rebellion uh, or the rebellion of the Nephilim against God, it's the same story. So in prehistory, we had the universal religion. We had giants. We had a rebellion against God. And so that brought about the first apocalypse. And in prehistory, they managed to enslave humankind. And so the creation of these giants, these snake-like beings, because they look just like uh, the seraphim angels, their fathers in the first generations. They don't look like that today um, as, as a descendant or as a bloodline. Um, but what Lucifer, what Satan was trying to do was take his revenge out because all of this is connected back to the angelic rebellion. And so humankind is destined to uh, be raised higher than angels. And this is not what the rebellious angels want. So this is all part of the angelic rebellion. And so when prophecy talks about rebellion, it will come about again in the end days, just as it did in the antediluvian period where the first apocalypse came and the second apocalypse will be by fire not by water and so 
when these forces and partnerships revived after the flood, we see the first rebellion taking place and again to to enslave humankind and bring on the universal mystical religion. We see this at Babel, where Nimrod is the Antichrist figure and he usurps absolute control and usurping of power is one of the sort of common traits to uh, the Antichrist. And so he usurps power as king. They bring in the mystical religion. They force everybody to worship. They develop the seven sacred sciences and they're going to rebel against God. And if humankind actually succeeds in the rebellion against God, the dark angels win. And so they need to enslave us. And so God stepped in and confused the languages so that it wouldn't happen again until the uh, the time that's been ordained, which is which is the end time. And so we will see another rebellion, another stand against God, just as it did, as it occurred before the flood and at Babel. And so when we look shortly after the flood, these Nephilim, either from a recreation or surviving the flood, they once more usurped all of the main kingships after the flood. And so when we look at the Amalekite dynasty, the Egyptian dynasty, uh, the Sumerian or the Akkadian or the Mesopotamian dynasties, the Mitanni dynasty, the Hittite dynasties, these are all Nephilim dynasties. And these bloodlines exist today. And they exist today in the royal families. And so most of the royal families, and they have genealogies to prove it, at least that's what they say. And they also have genealogists, and Lawrence Gardner uh, has written uh, many books about it as being a royal genealogist. They have the ability to take those genealogies all the way back to the, all the way back into prehistory and all the way back to the giants. And so this bloodline is existing today, and that's why I call it the, the descendants of giants or the bloodlines of the giants. And what these bloodlines are designed to do and have been designed to do all throughout history is, is to be kept pure to introduce the Antichrist. And so I will make a case in the book that the Antichrist of the end time will be a bloodline or at least they will present him as a bloodline descending down from the giants. So now we're ke connecting these ancient bloodlines to the royal families uh, around the world and some of the most powerful families in the world. And um, so a question that a lot of people will have is, is, so why aren't they giants today and why don't they have the, you know, the face of a, a serpent today? And so there's kind of two schools of thought. But I would encourage people, if they, if they ever get a chance to go see a King Tut uh, display, uh, look for a statue of Akhenaten, and that would be circa 1400 BC. And if you look at that face, you're still seeing many facial features that are uh, snake-like or vapor-like in terms of the uh, slanted eyes and the extended chin and the sloped forehead. And you can see through uh, prehistory, there's a significant amount of elongated skulls, and you'll see that in Egyptian history as well, and even as, as late as in Akhenaten. And try and keep the bloodlines as pure as they can. They still have to bring in other bloodlines, otherwise diseases and genetic things will come in. So they'll reintroduce bloodlines from related families that may have some human uh, bloodlines um, refreshing the bloodlines and so there's a, there's been a sort of a long continual dilution over time which is what most people will believe as to why they've come down to a size that uh, of a normal human for the most part and they don't have the same features as as they did even 3000 years ago or maybe even 2000 years ago and then the other theory which uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of but um, if people really get in deep into the genre, there's a specific genre about the lizard people and that they have changeling qualities. Um, that's possible, I suppose. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of that particular one, but uh, there is a, a large following out there that, that uh, says that they have the ability to uh, duplicate what a human looks like and when they're in private, they look like a lizard. I think that's pure speculation. I don't think there's any, any proof of that. 
And just as there's a lot of talk about the bloodlines of the Royals is an RH negative bloodline, and that's the uh, actual bloodline of the Nephilim. Uh, again, there's nothing to really prove that other than it's not a natural human bloodline, but they don't offer their blood out for research. And if they do, it's all internal because they really don't want to get this out. But within the mythology, whether it's a bloodline, uh, a special marker in the bloodline or a special marker in the DNA, they do believe in this and they call that the gene of Isis, uh, which is their, um, they say, th th their belief is that's the belief of uh, how the word Genesis came about. So you have the gene of Isis in Genesis. And so if you look at Isis, that was the wife of Osiris and they were, they were gods or fallen angels. And then they had um, Nephilim with the same names underneath. And so that's where they say the gene of Isis comes from. And that is still out there today. And in the end time, they're going to collect all of the people who have the gene of Isis. And those are the people that are going to rule the next world, not the average humankind. So they have no real need for, for humankind. And so when we start to roll this forward, and this is seems like all speculation, but I'll follow throughout the book uh, the, this, the, this history that uh, has taken place and how they've affected history. But when we bring that into the modern time, we have to look to what are they doing today? Well, if we look at uh, the world today, it is being prepared for world government. It is being prepared for the end times, and this is all the work of the secret societies in the other religion and the, and the bloodlines of the giant, because they want to bring about the end time. They want to bring about the Antichrist. They would prefer to do it not at the ordained time. They would prefer to do it any time other than the ordained time, but they will take the ordained time time if they have to and they will so if we start looking at what's shaping our politics today and what's shaping the belief systems and the education systems and all the propaganda that is out there it is all the same imagery and all of the same belief system and all of the same organizations that were were there before so if we go back to prehistory we had uh, world government in their belief system that, that came out of the Atlantean mythology and Atlantis was the helm of world government. They're trying to create the new Atlantis. You wonder why we had, we're just inundated with Atlantean mythology where uh, they were reigned over by 10 kings that were Nephilim kings in the Antiluvian world and be, we're inundated with it because they want to create the new Atlantis and those are the exact new words that they will use for the new age. And Bacon, who uh, is a very famous person from history and was a Rosicrucian and Freemasonry, um, he wrote a book called The New Atlantis. And what he's referring to is, is an age, a new golden age, where there is a world government that partners with a mystical religion and is reigned over by one leader. And that was the inspiration for the Royal Society, where all of our science has come back today. And that the Royal Society was just created as an ability to, to advance sciences and the religion and to worship and honor the great architect of the universe whom they call Lucifer. And so when we understand that all the education systems and all the belief systems and all the entertainment, it's, it's all connected and it's all inspired by these same organizations, it's not surprising that we see developing today this concept of world government. It's an ancient concept. They want one government that they can rule over just as they did in antediluvian times and at Babel with one sun-worshipping Babel relationship or as it's known in the end time, Babylon, and that they're going to have one king over there who will usurp kingship, which will be a modern Nimrod or a modern Nephilim. So they're working at bringing about world government and if we look to Daniel and to, and to Revelations we now find that the Bible prophesizes ten world empires or ten empires, ten kings. This is the Atlantean mythology manifested but predicted within the Bible and so you see again the same story being told 
the same end game is just who's going to win. And we see world government rising not through somebody like a Stalin or a Hitler trying to march across the world and conquer the world. We see it rising as a platform that the Antichrist will just be able to take control of. And so when we look at NAFTA or the EEC or whatever these trading blocks that are rising, look not for 10 specific nations, look for 10 groups of nations, 10 spheres of influence, 10 regions that will unite and have one representative that goes and, and, and begins world government. But just as before, we have to have the universal religion, the mystical religion as part of that partnership to make all of this happen. And that's why you see this war against Christianity why it's going out of the schools soon everything about christianity and the constitutions which were designed with this in mind will be used to persecute and sideline christians because christians and monotheists are their only stumbling blocks and they're progressively and i, and I use that word specifically they are progressively working towards this through left-wing politics which are the progressives and they've tried to create this many, many times. And the last most recent one, and it's a perfect analogy, and I'll cover it off in the book, is, is, the, is the rise of the Third Reich. So you have an Antichrist figure, you have the mystical religion, you have the Third Reich, the thousand-year reign that they're trying to recreate, you have the slaughter of, of, of the Jewish people, and then it would have also been the Christians thereafter. Uh, it is an exact Antichrist-type prototype just as Nimrod was. So again, what was before is going to be a gain. So they work at bringing about these things through specific secret societies. And you remember talking us talking about Freemasonry and Masonry in its ancient forms? Well, Nimrod was the first founder of the Masonic um, secret societies at Babel, and he wrote the first constitution. And then it was um, revitalized and in reformatted the constitution at Heliopolis in in uh, Egypt and that same organization with many genitive organizations has uh, survived ever since and we know that today as the Rosicrucians we know that as uh, the Freemasonry uh, organizations we know that as the Illuminati and then all the different organizations that they have spun off and that would be including the Gnostic religions, which they worship at their center, which created Theosophy, which also created New Age. We will will recognize these groups as groups like the Bilderbergers, that they are taking all the new money and utilizing them to influence the world and meeting in secrecy, just as the Bohemian uh, Society that meets in California is again about new money, not the old money, not the true bloodlines. Understand there's a hierarchy involved here. So Freemasonry has lower levels and then at the 33rd degree they become illuminated and become an adept. And from the Illuminati and from the enlightened people at the 33rd degree, the Illuminati drafts um, those adepts. And so that's the inner part. And then those people who have some bloodlines, some noble bloodlines and who are able to continue to progress with enlightenment, they are drafted into the Rosicrucians. And above the Rosicrucians is the Council of 300. And the Council of 300 comes from the 13 families of the pure bloodlines. And then you go back to the 13 bloodlines. And within the upper tier group, they're gonna keep three Antichrist figures ready to go at any time, raised from childhood, illuminated, in levels that a Rosicrucian of a lower level wouldn't have or Illuminati wouldn't have, but they've got an Antichrist figure ready to go all of the time. Some of the other organizations that these, or that, that these secret societies and families fund, people might uh, remember uh, the Skull and Bones. And so the Skull and Bones is just another one of these organizations and what their main thing to do is, is out of Yale, uh, in particular, they're going to draft in the pseudo blue, blue bloods from the United States. And then when they talk about pseudo blue bloods, that's again the bloodlines. It's just not as pure as the ones that came across from Europe. 
but it's the American purebloods. And of course, those families tend to intermarry. But the people being drafted into the Skull and Bones, they're the people going into all of these um, government organizations, organizations to control governments. And so most of them go into what an organization called the CFR first and that's the Council of Foreign Relations so if you look at any political shows and interviews they're going to bring on these advisors and people when they're talking about politics and many of them are going to come from the CFR this is from that organization and it's, and it's their job to bring about world government and there's not just the CFR that's an organization you have the Bilderbergers and they were doing the same thing only from a European perspective and that organization their end product was the EEC and we talked about that earlier as one of those rising empires just as we look at NAFTA as part of uh, a North American entity that's going to form into these 10 world governments and then there's another organization that people might be familiar with is the trilateral organization and they were created for Europe United States and Japan the three biggest economies in the 70s to again find a way to bring the world together as as one government that's their charter there's another interesting group and there's many of these webs that are working the leviathan of this of this organization is so immense you People can't imagine it. I can't imagine it. It's just everywhere. But there's a one that sort of brings us full circle is an organization called the Club of Rome. And the Club of Rome is an organization that was organized to bring about world government with, you guessed it, 10 empires, 10 blocks of countries. And they were organized in the late 60s and the early 70s. So this organization is above the Bilderbergers and is getting very close to the Council of 300 with its members. So very, very powerful members that are in this with, with pure bloodlines. And so not only do they want 10 empires, uh, the, this is where, and people might find this controversial, they decided they needed certain policies to cattle herd people, things that could cross borders and get people to move into uh, a direction of a world without borders. And so they came up with uh, so much of the environmental uh, protest and policies. They fund that. They came up with, if you can believe this or not, oh, the great overpopulation um, scare. So they're creating these apocalyptic policies from the 60s and 70s that they're continuing to use today. They created the, the doctrine of peak oil to, again, help cattle herd and manipulate markets. And... Also, what I think people will find interesting, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're a fan of or a believer in um, global warming or not, that's their doctrine. They introduced that one at the same time. And so their job is, is to cattle herd people into world government. And so we have all of these different institutions that are working together. And if we go back before Freemasonry, there was an organization called the Knights Templar. And the Templars were founded by these same bloodlines and these same organizations. And what the Templars did was they created modern banking. And so whether it was a check or credit facilities, and they grew wealthy over lending money to uh, all of the, the various monarchies to wage their wars. And when they were broken up, these organizations needed to reassemble and they split into several different groups. And so Freemasonry through Scotland where it originated and where some of the surviving Templars went was one aspect of it. And that was more or less the political aspect. And it grew with the expansion of the British Empire and with the French Empire. And so they also needed to replace the banking arm. Well, there was a family in Germany uh, who was working for some of the, the German bloodlines was brought in to, to be the bankers and that was the Bauer family. And then when they grew rich and powerful and became the banking arm of the agenda of these bloodlines and organizations, they moved to England, to, Un to, to London. And they felt they, they should change their name and coincidentally most people will be familiar with the family called the Rothschilds. That's who the Bauer family is, and they were created to fund these organizations. Then they, the Rothschilds, they drafted many families in the United States 
uh, and made them wealthy and they're loyal to the Rothschilds today. So if we talk about the Carnegies or if we talk about the Warburgs or if we talk about uh, J.P. Morgan um, and in particular the Rockefellers, all of these families were funded by the Rothschilds and they're totally loyal today and these are sort of that heart of that pseudo blue blood line that goes back to the Rothschilds who aren't as pure as the 13 families because this was a, a less pure line that was brought in after the demise of, uh, of the Templars but they were the banking arm. Now the profits from the banks, let me back up a step first Note that all the reserve banks in the world are owned by the banks. They're not government owned. And the Rothschilds own most of the banks. And the rest of the banks that are the ownership of the reserve banks were funded and created by the Rothschilds to act as their stable agents. Now, the profits that the banking industry makes, not in all countries, but particularly in the U.S., they can move their profits to trusts and not be taxed on it. And so you'll have the Rockefeller Trust and the Morgan Trust and there's there's just a incredible amount of these trusts. These trust organizations are used to sponsor uh, their concepts, their agenda, their ideas, bring about uh, the acceptability of world government to affect policy and teaching in schools. Um, whatever they want on the agenda, that's what they're funded to do. And we see that happen throughout our universities, throughout our schools today, throughout what happens in the media. It's all working from this, this tax-free money coming from the banks. Look in behind uh, any organization, just look at the, the, the symbology. So if you've got anything that has a, let's say for an example, um, derivative of Lucifer, um, whether it's uh, Lucent or anything like that and there used to be a company called Lucent Technologies uh, that had the red dragon as their um, their icon and uh, their address was 666 on a street in New York so they are very arrogant and but people don't look but you have to understand the language that they're talking about and so what they're what they're really trying to do is just sort of get people used to the concepts so that this isn't such a big surprise so that when world government comes about you're ready for it when socialism and they want to create a socialist government you're used to it because you've seen these ideologies all throughout that Christianity isn't a religion that you can trust in that the New Testament isn't accurate the Old Testament isn't accurate. These, these are all the document uh, the doctrines of what they're trying to do and when you see the imageries, whether it's um, with the alien myth mythos, look for the religion that's in the alien mythos. It's mysticism. It's Eastern mysticism. If it's evolution being taught in school, understand that comes out of Eastern mysticism. It's a mystical concept. It's not about um, that you just live and die. It's that it's, that it's part of recreation that you're... you're spirit will evolve over time to become a god. So it's a different spin, a different belief system into godhood, just as Eden, the, the big doctrine out of Eden is, is eat from the tree of good and evil so you can be like God. The whole doctrine is, is that they're going to try and deceive us into that we believe that we can rebel against what they would call the evil god and follow the good god, which they believe is Lucifer and that you're going to be able to evolve into gods and, and vibrate as the New Age religion would suggest um, because you are worthy, you're part of the bloodlines, you're being educated and you, you have all of these uh, um, uh, knowledge that they have provided because they believe knowledge is, 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 is absolutely essential to evolve into godhood. And so anything that you see today um, you need to critically take a step back and critically ask tough questions about why is it being presented in this manner because once you start asking those questions and you understand the imagery and the organizational structure you're going to see what's going on 
And so the point of the matter is, is not only to get people to understand so they can decode what's going on, it's just hopefully more people will understand because everybody's going to have to make a choice. And to be able to choose properly and understand what is going on is going to be so key because we're told in prophecy that even the elect will be deceived if that were possible. And so that means our church leaders are going to be deceived. And they are going to come at us from a religious perspective. The only way they can bring on a polytheist, and for those who don't understand the word polytheist, that's worshiping many gods, as in a pantheon. The um, only way they can bring on a polytheist mystical religion is destroy Christianity. And so they're going to come at us, and that's why you see books like the Da Vinci Code. It's why you see uh, so many things going on to prepare us. They're going to present to us that uh, Jesus did not die on the cross. And this is straight Gnostic belief because Gnostics believe they're Christians. They just don't believe in a divine Jesus and that he was a prophet like Buddha and all these other prophets from the past. And Jesus was just like them, a, 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 you know, an important prophet, but a prophet and a mortal nonetheless. So they are going to attack the resurrection, the virgin birth, and they're going to attack Paul, who uh, is sponsorship of most of the New Testament, and they have to destroy those concepts. And they believe they have the proof to do that. That's part of the secrets and the knowledge that they have. And unless you're totally prepared and understand what they're going to be talking about, you too might be deceived. So learn from prehistory, read the book, understand how to decode the times. And one of the most significant examples of preparing people for the end times and the propaganda and the imagery that goes with it is go look at pretty much any of the major holidays that we celebrate in North America today. And you're going to see they're inundated with this imagery, with this allegory and with this distortion. And so we have All Hallows Eve, which everybody is familiar with, and it's about devils and witches. And that's all part of the belief system. They believe it, it's good, not evil, like what we do, but it's a different perspective. We look at Easter. That goes back to Ishtar, uh, and the eggs are the fertility eggs, and all back into this ancient prehistory of Nephilim and gods and mating with uh, uh, human females to, to create giants. It's not the resurrection that it's known for, it's Easter. And those are the same gods as, whether it's Ishtar, it's also known as Isis in Egypt, it's the same god. Or Astaroth, as people might pick up, and variations of Astaroth in, in the Bible, or um, so many other names. Gaia would be the counterpart in, um, in Greek mythology. So Easter has been taken away with the bunny rabbit, fertility eggs, and with a female goddess. And not from the superficial imagery about the resurrection and we look at Christmas the same way well we know it's not the proper date but that's a, a sun worship takeover at the time of Constantine to homogenize the Empire to bring in mystical religions of Mithraism was the was the main one of that time but the Manichaeans were also part of this uh, which is all part of the same type of religions and ancient religions that Gnosticism and Theosophy and New Age come from so there was this this sort of combining and, and, uh, of dates and imagery into uh, what we know as Christianity's uh, birth with the Roman Empire, as opposed to the Jerusalem church and the original birth. So it changed radically in that form, and we see halos, which is part of the Egyptian religion. Um, we see images of uh, Jesus and the baby Jesus, which is an image of Isis, Osiris, and Horus as the Trinity and on and on and on, including December 25th. And so when we, we look at the uh, Mithraic uh, religion being introduced into Christmas, um, and that he also rose after three days, so we see a blending in on this and on the 25th and the solstice, typical polytheist religion sort of overlapping it. I think it's fine that we celebrate and also um, acknowledge that we ought to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Just understand that that date has been manipulated when Constantine uh, brought the religion to the Roman Empire. Uh, then we also look at the modern sort of manipulation of Christmas where we introduce 
Santa Claus and everybody thinks Santa Claus goes back to St. Nicholas. Well, this is not a St. Nicholas doing good for poor children and poor people. This is a fairy mythology inserted into Christmas. And the elves are part of the fairy mythology that we talked about before. And these little ugly elves, they focused on the naughty list and what they did to the children in an evil sort of way to the children that weren't good. And this 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 individual at Santa Claus was not Saint Nicholas and was a different character in the story. So this is another piece of fairy mythology that's just designed to take our, our belief system away and fool people. And it's a way of degrading Christianity in, in a way where people like to ha have a celebration that sounds good and everybody likes to do, but at the end of the day, it's slander against Christianity. And so I think we need to uh, understand that um, th the history and the meaning that's behind these allegories um, are things we need to learn and they're there for a reason, and they're not there for the betterment of Christianity.